and welcome back to a new season of What's Trending, New and Exciting and Expanded. Um, Randy Filio, and most of you know me, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. As you can see, there's four of us here that will be, uh, we'll be talking each week about how to save the city and save the country. And um, with that said, since this is a brand new show, let me introduce our, our staff and dignitaries. Yeah. Starting down here. Uh, my name is Terry Clark. Uh, I'm a longtime community activist, and I'm currently a city councilor in Ward 3. And? My, um, Deb Hamill. You are? Yes. You still are. I still am. And a longtime political activist. And I write stories and opinions and tell stories opinions. And I've worked on many boards in the city of Keene. And as you know, I'm Randy Filio, still, still on the city council and still doing TV shows and still talking to Deb, believe it or not. And this gentleman over here, the story behind this is we actually started arguing on Facebook. So rather than arguing on Facebook, I said, why don't we just argue on a TV show? And here he is. Hi, I'm Jerry Sickles. Um, I work in politics. Uh, most recently, I was the New Hampshire director for coalitions for the Donald Trump campaign. And we, we, we're not holding that against him. Um, but, well, I guess he won, so what, what can I say? That's right. So, starting off, um, we're going to have topics each week. It's going to be an hour show. We're going to do this every other week. Um, it's going to be ri wide ranging. We don't really uh, know exactly how our script is going to work, but. We're going to wing it and see if we can make it interesting. So with that said, who would like to start off with, uh, with a topic that uh, might be hot and trending? Anybody? Trending. I'm trending. not sure that it's trending, but um, I'm beginning a new initiative. It's a solar power initiative. I, uh, as you know, the uh, city is uh, always finding ways to save money. And uh, we have a, uh, an experimental um, uh, program going on down in Marlboro Street where we've replaced 25 streetlights with uh, lower um, lower energy LEDs. Uh, LED mm -hmm. uh, lights, and uh, we have I think there are two levels of them, and they're they're uh, letting them go at night and uh, having people drive down and uh, give their input on um, uh, how it, you know how they work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of them is a little brighter than the other. The other one's a little dimmer, and I think one is a little bluer. But anyway, they're gonna they're gonna try to um, retrofit the entire city. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, and what they say is that we're going to realize uh, substantial savings. Uh, right now, we spend around one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year for electricity on streetlights um, for most of the city. The downtown is a separate um, uh, line item, so uh, that that's a totally separate thing. But we just replace those with LEDs anyway. So what I was thinking is that before we retrofit the entire city with LEDs that are on the grid, um, in, in other words, that are attached uh, to the electrical lines, uh, and therefore we, we'll still have to buy uh, electricity from the utility, why not add to the experiment and take 10 or 15 of the street lights and retrofit them with solar-powered panels uh, to see, uh, number one, uh, uh, whether or not they work, whether or not they provide enough light, whether or not they last, um, and then uh, get into the costs of it and, and the, uh, you know, whether or not we ought to invest in things. Because it doesn't make any sense to spend $400,000 retrofitting lights where we're still going to be using fossil fuels. When the rest of the world is getting away from fossil fuels, uh, even cities in the United States um, are, are totally off the grid as far as the municipalities go. Um, why can't we do that? So I'm going to put together a proposal and bring it before uh, uh, City Council to see if we can't add that uh, experiment before we, we, we uh, uh, take a, 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 a capital improvement project on. Uh, that would retrofit everything. Do you, you have a, uh, do you have a, a, a timeline? Do you, do you have a, a date? Do you think you're going to try to get it before the council? Well, I want to do it this month. Um, right now, I have, I've been sending out feelers to, uh, to uh, people like John Condos, who is instrumental in getting uh, solar panels on the, on the co-op, and uh, other members of the uh, 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 Cities for Climate Protection Committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, and other like-minded people uh, who are who know a little bit about um, uh, uh, electricity and uh, efficiencies and and things like that to try to get input. 
And then I'm going to go to the uh, planning department and get uh, their input on you know, what, what it is they're doing and, and why they may not have thought about solar, um, whether or not we're just too timid or maybe they know something that I don't. Um, I can't imagine that. Today. Well, it's, <laughs> probably, it's probably true I, that they do. I believe it has come up with the planning department before. And I'm not sure if it was cost or the you know, output, you know, the candle power that solar lights put out. Um, now, when you're talking about this, have you seen them in action in other places? I've seen them in Florida, and it's, it has the array right over the light, mm -hmm. you know, right over the light fixture, probably the size of mm -hmm. your little laptop here or something like that. Well, the county, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, when they put the jail in, yes, uh, those street lights that go to the county jail are uh, solar powered lights, and they're still working fine. Um, so I guess that'd be a good one to look at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I have. That's one of the. Um, that's one of the feelers I have out there. I'm, uh, I'm trying to talk to Mr. Bouchard, uh, who's the assistant uh, um, administrator uh, for the county, to give to look back and, and to get as much data on that as possible. But um, recently, when um, our uh, sister city people from Einbeck, Germany, mm. uh, made a visit, uh, I sat down with members of the Public Works Department. And they absolutely blew me away with some of the things that they're doing there. Hmm. Um, they, of course, don't have uh, uh, many of the, the kinds of regulations that we do. Um, we have in the state of New Hampshire something called a net metering law, which uh, uh, limits the amount of electricity that can be put into the grid from alternative energy sources. Hmm. It's, uh, well, in my mind, it's, it's, it's there to protect the utilities' profits. Um, Recently, uh, I think it was last year, um, the legislature uh, doubled the amount of uh, kilowatts that was allowed onto the grid from uh, uh, alternative energy sources, from 50 kilowatts to 100. Mm. But that's nothing. That's nothing. So you know, we'd have to go. We'd have to go and, and get by barriers like that. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But you know, countries countries like Germany, uh, Japan. You know, even you know Bulgaria and, and you know you know places mm -hmm. that you'd never think of when you when you think about innovation and what have you are way way ahead of us, way ahead of us. And as far as the cost goes, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, U.S. manufacturers are way behind. Mm -hmm. They're way behind. Um, I costed out some of the uh, some of the, the the features that that were. Uh, I asked the Public Works Department of what you know what were the specifications. Um, and they're saying that anything that would provide um, 400 lumens, mm -hmm. and whatever, right. you know, a lumen is, a, it, that's how they measure brightness of, mm -hmm. uh, of lights and such like that. So uh, uh, I went online and I asked a, a number of companies from all over the world um, to, to give me a cost estimate on the, uh, the climate that we have because, you know, we, we have um, more days um, that, uh, you know, because of our northern latitude, during the winter, uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to account for uh, the number of number of hours in the day that mm -hmm. we're going to get light and that we're not going to get light. So in our latitude, it's uh, you know just to be on the safe side, we have to provide for uh, 14 hours of darkness per day, um, and that's that's just the worst case scenario. Of course, during the summer and other times, you'd never get even close to that. But in any case, most of the uh, companies in the United States are actually two or three generations behind uh, manufacturers in Sweden, China, and, and, and Japan. For example, one, one company, the lowest bid company that I found in, in Florida, came in at $4,750 for one light set. And the ones, the ones from China and Japan come in at $645. <coughs> It's That's a huge, a, it's a huge difference. Yeah, and the thing with solar too is, is unless you're getting, you know, uh, a rebates, tax offers, or something like that, um, or some kind of grant funding for that, the output of cost is so much money. It takes a long time to get back the initial cost that you put out. If you buy from the companies that are charging forty-seven hundred dollars, mm -hmm. but if you're buying from the company that's charging six hundred and forty-five dollars, mm -hmm. there's got to the be cost... a difference, I would think, with with such a big price difference. Yes, and the difference is the is the generational um, um, technology. They're mm -hmm. way ahead of us. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, China just came out with a new battery. I mean, you know, we talked about batteries. We've had the same lead acid battery for one hundred and fifty years, <laughs> essentially. 
I mean, with very little innovation, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what uh, uh, solar power storage is all about, and especially in the northern tiers here, is we need to have a powerful battery. Uh, and because of the temperature, uh, the efficiency goes down, the colder it gets. Right. So you need a bigger battery. Um, because we can't go directly into the grid because of the net metering laws. Exactly. If we didn't have the net metering laws, um, we could just have a $150 solar panel on top of every street light in any, uh, if every city mm -hmm. in the state, and every city could become a major producer. There's another law. You cannot just become a producer. It's not for any practical reason, it's a political reason. That's right. And so, so you're going to be looking into this and you're going to report back not only to the city but to this show in two weeks with a, with a massive update? Massive update. Massive yes, yes. update. Massive update, not a little yes. a, a massive yes. update. <laughs> Stay tuned on that because that is a good initiative and, and that's appreciated. It is. Energy is a big topic. It certainly is. Whether you're talking about fracking or, you know, anything. Look at New Hampshire. A lot of manufacturers don't want to come to New Hampshire because our energy rates are too high. They are. So, I mean, that, that's, that ties right into the economy. Mm hmm what do you got going on, Deb? Anything exciting? I don't have too much going on. Okay, good. I'm watching uh, what's happening about in the world. Along. See, we're back to where we were before. <laughs> we love this. How about our new person, Jerry? What, what's what's on your mind? Well, I just came off a pretty long campaign season. Um, it was very interesting. Very you were with a you were with a couple of different campaigns, and you yes, ended up with uh, started, Donald Trump. Started out working on Dr. Carson's super PAC and. Um, Spent about 45 days with Senator Cruz, and then uh, right after the convention, um, I was interviewed and ended up, ended up being hired to be the coalition's director for the Trump campaign. And we came close here, but didn't win. But um, the Brexit states, as I like to refer to them, <laughs> Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan, sort of came through. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a new president. So are you, um, are you still active? Uh you know, politically with with uh, with Trump or any other groups right now, or well, the campaign's over. I mean, I'm I'm uh, was recently elected. Your Secretary of Agriculture, right? <laughs> or VA. VA. Uh, that, that's the other one that he hasn't picked. Uh, I am a uh, member of the, of the Republican State Committee here in New Hampshire. I'm an elected member through Cheshire, so I'm politically active also. Mm -hmm. Well, like I was saying, that's how. Uh, that's how you and I met. We met on opposite ends of the spectrum on, on Facebook. We were throwing we were throwing Facebook punches at each other. It was it was speaking of throwing punches, what a campaign. What an election, huh? Mm. Unbelievable. Yeah. Thirty years of covering presidential <laughs> campaigns, presidential primaries. I've never seen something like this. You know, but I knew the and minute hopefully we never see something like this you, again. Hey, you never know. But it's like the minute Donald Trump yeah. threw his name in, I knew it was gonna be unprecedented. We talked about it on this show. And although I we wasn't did. for him right from the beginning, um, I learned, <laughs> I got used to him, and um, I think he's going to do a great job right now. It's like know? having a bad cold, you get used to it after a while. <laughs> like the Clintons. <laughs> I thought that th this election, um, not taking any sides right now, mm -hmm. was it, 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 it created, s I've never seen a level of decorum mm. so low. Exactly. Our bar has, has dropped to the floor. Um, as far as news sources, nobody knows who to believe anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't believe quotes from this that or you, the only thing you can believe are your eyes and your ears. But then when you see something mm -hmm. and you hear somebody say something outrageous, mm -hmm. then the media will just either ignore it or tell you that it didn't happen. And the big argument that we're having with each other is that we're, we're well, especially on Facebook. I hate the, I hate that. I, I don't know why I, I, I I'm drawn to it, but. Uh, uh, you don't know what source to believe. Right. You you know you hear a meme about this and you like it because that is something that you particularly would like to be true. But you have no idea whether it's true or not. But then it feeds upon itself, and the next thing you know, uh, people are getting rabid at each other <laughs> and uh, calling each other names and, and and such and arguing about things that probably aren't even true. Yeah. I generally tend to look for things maybe four or five sources. Right. If it's just one, if it's a single source thing, most of the time you have to really be skeptical. But if, if something appears in four or five sources, if there's a newspaper story or an online journalist type thing, then I tend to uh, think better of it. The dynamic this year, um, Terry, was entirely different. This was the year of the angry 
angry voter. Absolutely. Yes. It, it manifested on both sides, too. It manifested on the left with, mm -hmm. with Bernie Sanders and on the right with, with Cruz and Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, people are upset at the government. They believe the government is not listening that it's not, and that it's failing people. And it came out, it was really interesting. I, I don't, perhaps a, a candidate like Donald Trump wouldn't have, um, you know, wouldn't have been successful 10 years ago or maybe even 15 years from now, depending on what happens. Um, but uh, the, Well, especially true when, you know, early on, and I guess he's still uh, uh, coming up with these faux pas, uh, but, you know, in earlier campaigns, you know, you remember the Dean scream. Yes. Or, or musky crying. Yes. The, the, or Hillary the, barking. Well, the <laughs> smallest, no, but the small, years ago, the mm -hmm. smallest thing could dis, you know, der, de, you know, derail yes. a campaign. They'd be laughed out and they'd be out of the race. Mm -hmm. But it, this time around, it just seemed like Mr. Trump could just say and do anything he wanted to do. And then the next day, even contradict himself. Mm -hmm. And it's, he's not the only one. There were others that did the same thing. Right. Uh, but guy. people, but people, like I said, it goes into this, this feeling that you don't know what to believe. You can't believe it unless you saw it. And then if you, even if you did see it, you might just, for some reason, forgive it. Uh, I can't believe that his campaign wasn't over the first week. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the whole political correctness thing has gone so far it's gone so crazy that people are afraid to say anything. People who are Christians are afraid to say Merry Christmas until this year and stuff. But it's like we were sitting there, the regular, the average Joe was watching this person on TV that we know is a mouse. You know, he's a showman. He's a, he's a true New Yorker, and what's in your head and in your heart just comes pouring out of your mouth. He said stuff, and I remember looking at you and being like, oh, this is it. He's done, 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 done. And he wasn't. Right. And it's just because people were sitting back there going, good, it's about time somebody said something. And that that's, was the, the mantra of the people. There's people that were calling me up asking me about electors that were never even registered to vote before. He did bring in a whole new crew of people. He's interested the nation in politics once again. Whether his way of doing it was right or wrong, I mean, people have, have gotten involved. I think the Democrats found out late, what the Republicans found out early in the, in the campaign season, that they didn't want a family named Bush and they didn't want a family named Clinton. Absolutely. And, and the Republicans found out early. Very and, early. And Bush was done early. However, of course, there was, what, 16 candidates. Yes. So, uh, but... um. With with the Democrats, you know, unfortunately, and, and I agree that mm -hmm. the Democrats pretty much had anointed her as the candidate, and Bernie Sanders struck a nerve, yes. and 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 I think, um, you know, Trump grabbed a hold of that same type of energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went completely negative, but it worked several times. You know, right? Yeah, just, yeah more than once. And um, in, in the end, it just showed, and I know there's a lot of things we had. You know, the Russian hacking. There's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of places to point partial blames, but in my opinion, it was just that. The bottom line, it rests with it rests with the candidates and it rests with the parties. You know, the DNC saw stuff going on; they should have just straightened things. You know, you had the Debbie Wasserman Schultz problem there. Bernie was great. They they had they anointed Hillary Clinton, yep. and that that was the problem. You know, I make no bones about it. I, I personally don't like her, but if she would have been a good candidate, then then more power to her. Things came out every time something came out. Instead of taking responsibility for it, her own writings or something that she might have done a decision, she turned it around to again that vast right wing conspiracy or this or that. She didn't take responsibility nor. Did she hold herself accountable to the people? Well, I thought. Debbie, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not <laughs> out to get you. You have to admit that over the last 25 years, she's been the target of every ridiculous. I mean, they you, mm. the the things that have passed for news about Hillary Clinton these days used to be uh, in tabloids, and, and everybody used to look at the tabloids and laugh because they knew they weren't true. Now, you can't tell me that anyone can believe that she is guilty of all of the ridiculous things that they have been hammering her for the last 25 years, starting with Rush Limbaugh and the negative things of, uh, of uh, feminazi, for example. Mm. You know, when you start doing things like that and you throw mud long enough and you tell a lie long enough, people believe it. But mud sticks. And, you know, but she's I committed. think the big thing that came out of this election mm -hmm. is it showed how incredibly unaware of basic civics that the American people 
That's are. I agree. They they don't know they don't understand uh, uh, what the role of Congress is mm -hmm. when they're blaming Obama for budgets and for cutting this and not providing money for that. The president has nothing to do with that. All all of these all of these budgetary things and appropriations are the purview of the House of Representatives. But people, you know, were were just told that it was Obama's fault. And well, you know what? If you know if you have a Congress who, right from the outset, says, we're not going to do anything that you want, Mr. Obama. We are going to stonewall you at every opportunity. We're not going to give you anything. And then when, when the, the economy starts going to hell or something starts going wrong, you blame him for it? Well, wait a second. Yeah, there's a lot of blame. Uh, there's certainly enough Eight blame years. to go around. At the very first meeting that uh, President Obama had with the Congress, and they start even making suggestions, he looked at him and said, I won the election. And he was never really uh, showed any desire to work with Congress. Uh, there was a complaint in his own party that he was aloof, mm -hmm. that, that he wasn't the kind of president that tried to build consensus. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Uh, that's a matter of opinion. And of course, uh, your opinion is going to differ from mine. It's not, that's not really something that's factual. Um, you know, as far as whether or not he was going to work with Congress, that's that just simply doesn't fly because, you know, I'll just take the Affordable Care Act, for example, which was an, a Republican initiative. That was a Republican initiative. Instead of going single payer, like most Democrats wanted him to do, he introduced to Congress the Affordable Care Act, which was introduced in Massachusetts Romney. by Mitt Romney. <clears throat> right. And it, was, and, it was, and it was created by a Republican think tank one of the ones in California. The Heritage this Foundation. Was, this was not, and he did that because he knew that he had an opposition Congress that he needed to work with. And what did they do? They took the bill and decontented it and took out everything that, that really would have made it work and then passed it and expected it to work. That's, so, well, so they're saying have, they're going to have a chance to fix it now. Yes. The, the, that's, that's as, as a Democrat, that's the one thing I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to try to sit back and relax, which is not going to be easy. <laughs> but okay, you get a Republican president, Republican Congress, Republican you know, Senate, mm -hmm. and you're saying, okay, we're going to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. We'll see what they replace it with. And, yeah, and now it's like, um, what, 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 uh, what, geez, we're going to keep it, we're going to try to keep this part, we're going to try to keep, uh, geez, what the hell are we going to do? And, and I'm what are the millions and of people who have signed up for it and who have health care now are going to do? They, they were showing that four of the states that, that Trump won that typically go Democrat mm -hmm. um, th had the highest percentage of people on the Affordable Care Act. They were showing, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin. They were showing uh, West Virginia. You know, they were showing particular states that are heavily um, influenced that are on the Affordable Care Act. The coal miners down in West Virginia are paranoid now oh. because they're going to lose black lung. Health, black lung. They're going to lose that health care if they, you know, eliminate the Affordable Care Act. Now they're saying re repeal and replace. There is they have nothing to replace it with. Nothing. There's not even a piece. There's nothing to replace it with other than just some rhetoric out there. So well, lazy, we will, we lazy, they're going to replace it with laissez-faire economics, which is unregulated economics, and they're going to let the insurance companies go ahead with. And if you remember before the Affordable Care Act, uh, it, insurance premiums were going up 30, 30, 35, 40 percent every single year. And they're going up now. They're going right. up at a, as a, le a lesser level. It should be called, but the, they un have should gone be called the Unaffordable Care Act. It because it's unaffordable. I mean, because of the form you, that you Congress have, passed. Yes. Out of, you have, out of the average costs. family has to, the average family has to, uh, around ten thousand dollars before you can even use the insurance. Right. What's good of having insurance if you can't even get around to using it? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny what you, you both mentioned there, and you mentioned Massachusetts. Uh, my son is in Massachusetts. He works for a, mm. a federal courthouse down there. He was on the Affordable Care Act. We kind of saw the writing on the wall that might get eliminated. He switched over to uh, um, Romney Care, as we might call it. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, it's much more efficient. Massachusetts plan is much more Because efficient. it isn't gutted. Because it isn't gutted. Congress gutted the plan that, and then what, pointed what, their finger and said, you see, it doesn't work. So what they should do, if they're going to replace it, Look at Massachusetts and say, okay. Or, or better yet, let the states work this out. That's what that thing shows, is that this, uh, this one-size-fits-all thing just right. does not work. Exactly. Let, this, let the states work this out. What, what's good for Massachusetts might not be good for Wyoming. 
Exactly. Well, the state of New York. Oh, I, mean, the, I don't know. The we put on our pants the same way. Oh. Yeah, but it's a total different. It's a total no, different thing. The the People's Republic of Massachusetts. I live oh. down there, and I'm telling you, it's it's totally <clears throat> totally different. Massachusetts has a Republican governor. Yeah. Okay. Now, excuse they me. They do. Now, this rhetoric but it's a that total people throw out. Ball game than let's let's stick with the facts. New Hampshire and New York. I mean, we're going to disagree on on opinion, mm -hmm. but at least let's 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 stick with the facts. You know, Massachusetts has been traditionally more liberal in the legislature, but they've had more Republican governors mm -hmm. in the in the modern period than, than New Hampshire has. Mm -hmm. So I mean, to call them the People's Republic of Massachusetts <laughs> is just is just rhetoric, and it haven't just lived there for ten years and seeing. How I went to high school. I house, went to high school. I graduated from Senate. high school from Ludlow High School. I mm -hmm. lived down there for four years after my father uh, uh, left Kingsbury's and moved, mm -hmm. moved down there, um, and we lived there for four years. And so I've experienced Massachusetts. Right. I know all about it. Um, it's a different ball game than the Granite State. It certainly is. In Massachusetts, they actually care about their fellow neighbor. They, you know, the tax the tax level down there is actually less than it is here. That's you know, true. For 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 middle income uh, people, your tax burden in Massachusetts is much less than it is here in New Hampshire. Because New Hampshire, we rely on the property tax, right? And we get this all the time at the city council level. You know, boy, taxes are so high. Well, let us raise money some other way. Flat well, tax. Well, let's have, let's have some of the money that, that the state uh, has promised us. Let's stop holding it back. Let's stop Unfunded balancing. Unfunded mandates are you talking about? Well, in holding back, holding back money that they, that they traditionally have given us. Like the rooms and meals tax. The, the, the rooms, rooms and meals tax. tax the, the pension the, system. The, they, they hijacked both of those. You know, the, state, the state looked at it and said, we're tight on revenues. Uh -huh. They looked at pension, they looked at rooms and meals and go, huh, I guess we'll keep those right here. And so, as Terry knows, the budget comes up the next year for city council. First thing we find out is we're $800,000 $800, short because the state withheld it. Mm -hmm. So before we even talk about getting, you know, raising or lowering taxes, we've got to make up... You've already been cut. <laughs> we've, already, we've got to make up $800,000 before we even start looking at the budget. So we're already in the hole. So, so, you know, Terry's right with that when we talk about states. Um, you know, you look at state spending. Um, What's that say? In the, in the state, we'll uh, see. I'm, I'm glad we're not live because right. we're getting bothered in the background here. Um, <laughs> don't hit the table. Well, I've been hitting the table. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but when some. we talk about the state. As long as I don't hit of, you, okay. The, oh, you can. The okay. state of New Hampshire gets away with being this fiscally conservative mm. um, legislature when the truth is, we can't raise any other revenues because of the home rule. We we can't we can't bring any more you know monies in to help offset the taxes, and the state in their wisdom keeps money that's due to come to us. So well, well let's talk, excuse me let's talk then about a little bit of reform. How about let's reform the public sector pension thing? Why did uh, why not go to a defined contribution plan and get away from a defined benefit plan? Uh, there's a really good thing, um, uh, there's some good uh, material out there. There's something called the 50 state pension bomb and we're part of that. We, ha we uh, have a significant problem uh, with underfunding. And, I, and of course you can't do anything about it for the people that it's on it because a deal is a deal. But I think, that, I think going forward a good thing to do with, with, with future hires would be to offer them what they offer in the private sector, a 401k plan. Rather than a defined, uh, rather than a defined benefit, where it's fine in the good years, but in the years when the market is down, you have to make that difference up. That would be it. That would be a meaningful reform. Yes, it would. Um, unfortunately, um, we have we have politics involved. Um, Congress. Let's start there. How come they don't have a four hundred one k program for themselves? Hey, let's do that first. <laughs> I'm in. All in favor. Why don't they? <laughs> Why don't they? They have they have a gold a gold policy. Mm -hmm. I mean it's I mean it's, it's it's bad enough that they only work you know a third of the year, you know, and that they and I you know, I'm not disagreeing with that. I, you know, the public sector okay. is public sector. And and uh, and public pensions um, used to reflect what uh, uh, companies used to give the average worker. The average worker used to be able to have pensions. Mm -hmm. But that's been cut out. So now uh, uh, 
public pension systems are viewed as the bad guy because, uh, well, if I can't have it in my job, then I don't want them to have it either. But the reality is, is that we treat our workers terribly, terribly. We underpay them, we overwork them. We think that, we think that work is why we are living. Mm. It's not, we're not, we're not working to, to live, we're living to work. And that is a bad priority. I mean, that, that is a bad life priority. And that's why rich people live a lot longer than poor people is because there's a lot of stress involved mm -hmm. and uh, the stress causes uh, things like drug addiction, huge drug addiction, and it's even going to get worse. So just because the public uh, pension system is still there doesn't mean that it's bad. It, it means that we haven't abandoned it yet, like we abandoned the American worker. You know, yeah, you're right. There used to be some honor in, in people that owned major businesses yes they wanted their employees to succeed they gave you know they provided good health care programs they provided pensions they provided vacations mm -hmm. you know they provided a, a, a more than a living wage with bonuses and now you look at the average uh, you know corporation we all know people that are actually nervous to take the vacation because they're afraid they'll be eliminated right. before they come back disposable workforce in the old days it was like they, they brought you up like you were a family we trained you. You started here on a printing press, and look at you now. You know you're heading up this whole division or something like that. There was pride. There was pride in owning the company, and just everything. Everything's so different. They wanted you to play twenty different. years. They wanted you to retire from them. Right now, companies don't want you to stay more than three or four years. Correct. They, they don't want to pay you. They want you to move on, and they'll bring in mm -hmm. you know a college grad who because there's so many of them out there that and they can pay less. They can pay less, and and then they bring them up three or four years and. Bye-bye. So, yeah, the whole, and it's not a, I don't even find this as a Republican Democrat. Mm -hmm. It's just sad, you know, how, how our major corporations have gone that way. And I know, Terry, you've, you've looked at this before, too. You know, the, the difference between CEO pay and your mm -hmm. worker pay. You know, CEOs have always made well, and they should. I've never said you've got to slash CEO's pay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the old trickle down doesn't trickle down anymore. Never you know, did. It, 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 yeah, it's it's now it's just even well, worse. That's a whole other subject. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I mean, now if you look at, I mean, a CEO can run the company into the ground and get like a hundred million dollar, you know, mm -hmm. parachute. Okay, well, you screwed it up. Or if they screw it up, rather than you know tightening the belt and pointing the finger at them, they just lay people off. Let me use that to join and actually agree, probably with Jerry, in the in criticism there of, are firsts of, on of, everything. Of, of, president, of President Obama's performance in office. And it's not only his, it's been every president. And that is uh, Wall Street. And the appointments that are made uh, in his government, um, made up of, of the people who, who run Wall Street. It has, it has created such an unfair economy for the average person that, that it, they'll just never catch up. The rules are stacked against us. Now, when they, when the, you know, Dodd-Frank and all of these fixes, you know, that really didn't work, the whole structure of Wall Street has changed. It used to be where you would invest in a company that you thought was going to make a better product. And that, boy, this company has real promise because it makes a better widget. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll invest in that. Mm -hmm. But that's not how they're doing it now. They have these minute traders or second traders or, you know. Day traders. Or day traders. I mean, they, they, actually, they actually are allowed in a room on the stock exchange with their computers so that they can, because, so that they can be a millisecond closer to the action. And they have these computer robots that trade by the millisecond and they make pennies, pennies, pennies. They're manipulating the market. It has nothing to do whether or not a company actually has value. It's about making a profit right now. They don't look forward to, to dividends two years down the road. It's dividends next, next week. And getting back to government, if you look at, excuse, oh, excuse me, for cutting in on you, um, one of the, I'm going to stop banging on the table here, yeah. one of the issues that Hillary Clinton took a hit on was she was too cozy with Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump said, you know, we can't have any more of that. Well, you know, I don't know as far as draining the swamp goes, but if you look at the appointees, um, they're billionaire Wall Street executives. So I don't, I don't think on that part the swamp's been drained 
um, too clearly. You know, I, I've You're had some of my Republican political political people who've been in there forever with power and who have done nothing. I don't mind having successful people. I don't either. Uh, being in charge of the economy. Uh, I just wanted to jump back to something Terry was saying. Part of the reasons why the market is so skewed is because of the monetary policy, too. We've had several rounds of quantitative easing, which was good because it kept interest rates, rates low. But the other thing it did was it made stocks and real estate the only game in town for money to go to. And in a way, uh, the rich never had it so good except under Obama's policies. He was one of the best presidents they've ever had in terms of uh, them prospering. Well, in that respect, yes, uh, president, uh, Republican and Democratic presidents over the last 20 years have pretty much been Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, you have, you have uh, an elite, a, an economic elite who actually run this world. The Fed uh, is not, you know, that is a misnomer. It's not owned by the government. It has nothing to do with the government. It's, it's a private bank. It's a yeah. private bank that was created in, what, 1920 by the richest people in the world. It's a British um, corporation. Yeah. And uh, it is owned by, by the richest bankers in the world. And they're the ones who determine how the United States economy is, is going to work. And when, okay, this real estate bubble that happened some time uh -huh. ago, allowing, allowing banks to not only lend money, but to get into these, get into these products was one of the biggest mistakes that, that ever happened. They should have just, you know, it used to be illegal. Just as it used to be, it used to be when you uh, when you lent money at uh, nineteen percent or twenty percent, they used to call that usury, and they, they used to call these people loan sharks, and you put them in jail. But now it's the law of the land, and that's why we got to get rid of these. You know, we got to change the regulations on Wall Street and actually uh, make them start working for 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 progress in, 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 in products and in, in making. If you're going to make America great again, then you're going to have to start taking your American companies and have them produce a real product, a quality product, instead of these, these gimmicks. Well, in terms of regulations, I'll, maybe this will surprise you a little bit. I, I would be very happy, in exchange for eliminating some other laws, and let me get into that in a second, I'd be very happy to see us uh, go back to Glass-Steagall. I think it was a big mistake, to, and I, I've had a, a securities license since 1984, so I, I, that's sort of the world I come from. <laughs> I think it was a big mistake to allow banks to be able to commingle the money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the bank's money, with customer accounts. Uh, that's, that was bad. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think Dodd-Frank Dodd uh, worked out well at all. It's part of the reason why the services that... Um, we used to get for free from a bank. Mm -hmm. They have to charge you for it now. It, it did nothing. Two of the biggest players in this, this housing crisis was Fannie and Freddie. It did nothing mm -hmm. to uh, reform them. And it, it codified too big to fail. So I, I would say, you know, uh, there's, some, there's some things we should go back to. I, I think the, the nation was served very well from the Depression right up into uh, when President Clinton uh, signed that law. Uh, worked very well. Um, and the markets were old-fashioned, like you were saying before. You know, bring back a regulation like that and get rid of some of the, this other patchwork stuff, which, you know, maybe was well-intended but hasn't worked. I agree. So. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. <I'm, laughs> wow. What else do I talk about now here? Yeah. Um, it only took 40 minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is good. Well, it is, and I have no problem with, with appointing successful people. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you take you know, a CEO of uh, one of the largest oil companies in the world and making a secretary of state when the president holds, well, we don't know exactly how much he holds because he won't release his tax returns, but, you know, how, 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 much, how much oil in, 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 do we own over in Russia? And, um, and now, you know... How much we oil have, do we own in Russia? No, excuse me, Trump. We as in Trump. We, we as in Trump. President. Um, and, and that's where I have a, a problem with some of his employees. You know, mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're President Trump, Okay, and all of a sudden now, you know, there's there's a problem with Russia, and you're Trump, and you're looking at it. It's like, man, they're really screwing our country over. But I can't lose that amount of money. In, personal, in personal, in personal. Investment. I can't lose my personal investments over in Russia. And now I've got my uh, Secretary of State, who's a uh, a big oil guy, 
So what's his priority? Is it the, the country or is it let's take care of these oil deposits here? It's got to be the country. There's so many well, checks and balances. We're breaking new ground. We've never had the, the, a the checks and balances had, have been crossed. Well, we're we're breaking but, new ground. We've never had right. a president, and this was all known to the American people. All along. I mean, this was all known that, that we are we were possibly forty eight percent of them possibly 40? possibly going to elect. A person that had uh, worldwide business holdings. Mm -hmm. So, but we are breaking new ground. I, I do agree that uh, he's got to do everything he can to, you know, get rid of the conflict of interest stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. I understand that before the inauguration, they're going to come out with their plans. So I'm anxious to see what he has to say on that. There's always been a problem with the fox and the chicken coop syndrome. Uh, you know, um, we we try to give these people uh, who are you know very knowledgeable in the field. I think Joseph Kennedy was the first one in the uh, Securities Exchange uh, mm -hmm. um, um, Commission or yeah. whatever it was back in the Roosevelt era. Um, I mean, Joseph Kennedy was probably the, one of the bigger, uh, well, I, I won't defile his name, but he, 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 he played by his own rules. Mm -hmm. He manipulated, he he manipulated and, and played by his own rules. Um, and the um, history will say, will tell you that he actually uh, went in and reformed. He created the Securities and Exchange Commission. Yeah, he, he reformed the system because he knew how it worked and he knew the bad stuff, so he fixed it. But after the question is, after, after, he made his after he made his millions himself. But the question you always have to ask yourself um, is, do we really trust that fox in, in, the, in the chicken coop? Is he there because he you know, well, if you if you uh, if you appoint somebody to the EPA who doesn't believe uh, in regulation uh, of of the air and the quality of our water, um, that that's that's antithetical. I mean, you you know that that's the fox and the chicken. You know, have lawsuits against the EPA, and that's what people are saying about the the choices that uh, President Elect Trump is making for his cabinet. Is that there are a lot of people that he are, he's appointing to to. Uh, to agencies for the sole purpose of eliminating those agencies. And we've known for years since Roosevelt that traditionally the Republican Party was against any of those regulatory agencies. They don't want any of them to exist. It's just in their basic philosophy. I'm not saying they're wrong or they're, or they're, or they're right, but that's just the way that they have traditionally felt. So this time around, it looks as though that we are going to have uh, people in in the cabinet, uh, who will, if not eliminate uh, some of these agencies, make them uh, inefficient, uh, ineffectual. Well, I can assure you, as a Republican, I don't have my private air supply or water supply, so I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested in that too. Mm. Uh, I just think, though, that uh, we've gone way overboard. I mean, for goodness sakes, if you have two ducks fly over a water puddle, they want to declare it a wetlands. I know that's. I, I, so I, I, I think. Actually, what I'd like I'd like to see was I'd like to see this some of this stuff taken out of politics, and just get a, a, a group of people in and come up with recommendations of what regulations work, mm -hmm. for both big and small business and what ones don't. That's what I'd like to see happen. But interestingly, we were talking in the city council recently. Uh, back in 1964, Keene was uh, given the distinction of an all-American city. I and, remember. And they were Dating reading. Myself. And they were reading I some was of the. I just born. Yeah, they were, uh, they were reading. I think it was um, uh, uh, Mayor Mallett's uh, proclamation, mm -hmm. and one of the things that was that they that they really took pride in is filling in those those pesky uh, wetlands, mosquito laden wetlands. Yes, filling in all of those wetlands, you know, and making productive land out of them. Mm -hmm. Well, hasn't that turned around? Because like Keene is essentially a swamp, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, it, before then we really didn't. Uh, we had different priorities. We really didn't understand the value of wetlands. And we've made regulations now where you can fill in wetlands, but you've got to create new ones. And you've got to yeah. make sure that the water table works for us all. And it doesn't, you know, uh, one person who wants to develop a piece of land for their own benefit doesn't end up flooding the town of Winchester. Well, and, and you're right, Terry, because if you think, just back, of course, we had that hundred-year, you know, floodplain, flood which now is, you know, yearly. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, we, we filled in all those so-called swamps, and every time it rains, look at the east side. Oh, you by know. the pub. Yeah, I mean the, the yeah. pub. You know, yeah. certain areas of Keene. So we fill those in, but it costs us millions down the road. Mm -hmm. So we, we're penny wise and pound foolish, 
we dumped it in, put a few buildings on it, then we have to pay millions later to, to clean up the mess. I was surprised to learn how high the water table is in this keen area. I mean, oh. when they were building the, um, the YMCA, they wanted, to go, they wanted to have a regular pool, you know, where the deep end would be 10 or 12 feet, and they kept running into water. And that's why the pool out there, someone told me that's why the pool out there is only eight feet deep. Well, Keene used to be a, a, a glacial lake, yeah. mm. Cheshire Lake. You can lake. tell, it looks like a, a big pine it, it was, And it was part of an even larger lake, uh, Hitchcock Lake. Uh, after, the, after the last ice age started to retreat, it, it, uh, it dammed up the Connecticut River about New Haven. And uh, it became a huge lake that went all the way to Northfield. And then, of course, uh, this valley here, uh, it, it, it filled it filled up as you know as a huge lake. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the 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 aquifer here. Yes. You know, and they we're we're always building in places where we really shouldn't. We shouldn't have never built it on on Keene. Well, it, technically, it, technically, it, technically, yeah, we would we would we wouldn't be here if. Uh, well, no, I mean that's why we're place, keeping it within the bypass. The places, <laughs> well, the places where they end up building uh, factories is always on the flattest piece of land because it's the cheapest place to build. But it always displaces the most water as well and causes the most problems down the road. So unintended costs are something that we really need to pay attention to, whether it be by regulation or whatever it is. Just because it's cheap to build a factory on a piece of land doesn't mean that there isn't costs somewhere down the road to somewhere else. And I think there's so many regulations now that make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, whether it's uh, the planning regulations, the setbacks, the riparian buffer zone, you know, EPA things, what you can do, charge in the soil. Look at Monadnock Marketplace. I was on planning board for all of that. You know, and I remember the I beginning. remember that too. I remember in the beginning not where Home Depot is. It's like, oh no, 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 there's this and it's wetlands. Well, we know it is. You know, there's certain birds that fly in and fly out. And then there were some sandbags found <laughs> by a culvert and things like that and you can see you know people would drive by and they're like well have they started building yet I'm seeing huge huge piles of sand out there and dirt that's called charging the soil you put that there you get the water out and you're just moving it along and you know that that's not good that's not good for a wetland area they did have permission though to do a lot of that work out there but that, the entire city long, of Keene there's a long history behind the old Conover Mall that, that you were there you remember that as a long I was there all the way to the end to designing the bollards that went in front of Target yeah. that, that it was a question of whether they were uh, considered signage because they're the red ball in front of Target mm -hmm. I think that cuts really to the, to the to the core of the difference between Democrats and Republicans now it's it, <laughs> I'm gonna make a, a, a broad statement that most Republicans, or their basic philosophy is laissez-faire, let the market go, uh, the least government is the best government, you know, that, that kind of thing. That's a libertarian part of, 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 of that platform. And not to have regulations or limit regulations because the market is going to take care of things. And me as a social democrat, I have, I'm a bit skeptical of that because I recognize human nature. I understand that many, many, uh, many people who are in business are, operate right on the line, mm. and many of them cross the line. So what do you do? How do you keep the people on the side of the line if you don't have regulations? Let me count that from another way. Um, I think the default setting for a Republican would be to all of us acknowledge that there are societal problems. I think if you're a Republican, your default setting is let's try to let's first try to find a private sector solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a Democrat, let's let the government handle it. Let's create a department of this and a department of that. And that's how these bureaucracies have just grown and exploded and gotten bigger um, over the years. I'm saying the same thing, I guess, but mm -hmm. just from my, right. my side yeah, of things. I mean, you're trying to find the, the middle ground, but I think Terry's saying, you know, where, where's the middle ground? You know, how much... And that's the problem. There, there is, isn't. We don't where's want as much ground? government, as much regulations, whereas, you know, the more regulations and the more government is going to keep people more in line, is what that, I feel that the Democrats think. Let's take this local. As city councilors, mm. what can happen, and it's probably not 
really in your purview um, alone, but boy, I would like to see businesses come in here that with with good wages. I mean, all we ever seem to get are big box stores or another restaurant. We have like eight Mexican restaurants in Keene now. <laughs> we just opened another, we just opened another new one. I, I mean, what what do you think has to happen right now, citywide and, and not just Keene everywhere? Right. Because you know the box store thing has gone the other way. Mm -hmm. Even manufacturing now has, has gone the other way because they ship so much overseas. Right. In the, in the city right now is we fight to keep what we have here because what every community has, every other community wants. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have the CNSs of the world, and um, some people have said, "Oh, geez, consider you know concerning the airport." You know, you guys bent over a little bit backwards con mm. concerning their hangers down there. Even though we didn't, I mean, we, we but we worked with them. Yeah. Um, you, right now, it's just a matter of keeping what you have. Right. Because communities, companies are just bailing. You know, they're, they're, they're looking to go on the cheap. For looking one to go reason overseas. or another. And, and we also did a lot of, City Manager John McClain did a lot with the Tax Increment Finance and District. You know, you do a lot to, to, to schmooze a new business to get create, a new business. Create infrastructure. Create that will, infrastructure. That will, in, that will entice businesses to come to town. And, and on the same vein is, Jerry mentioned it, a, a workforce. Mm. We have lost uh, what we had in, in the, we used to have one of the most valuable workforces in the country in, in terms of uh, the machine industry mm -hmm. in, in, right. in the city of Keene and, oh, and, the, and the Springfield, Vermont Valley, right. and Peterborough, and such like that. And we have lost that talent pool. Yes. And we are not, we, we need to be able to uh, offer uh, companies who want to move into town a workforce mm -hmm. that may not necessarily uh, be, be uh, expert on their particular business, but people who can learn their business. And the big thing now is like going towards that is automation. A lot of that's been lost to whether it's automation or computers and things like that. I still want my country to be the one that makes the robots, though. Exactly. But following up on what you said there, um, a small thing like key nights, okay? Mm -hmm. And ter Terry's right as far as if you're going to have a family move in, you know, you got people going to up and relocate. They look in, you know, a lot of families skate. Their children play hockey. You know, those those type of things. Right. And they used to look at Keen. And, and I know a couple of families that did this. Mm -hmm. they, they looked at the arena, oh. and these are people that really, you know, have the kids that, you know, multiple things, the ice yes. skating, the ice, other things. Key and Ice coming in has hmm. really helped um, as far as even, and I've talked to somebody at CNS about this, I was speaking to somebody the other day, that they relocated to Keen, but they wouldn't have come if Key and Ice had been there. Correct. And um, if you talk to, um, kind of being all over the place here, Bobby Rodriguez is the coach for the Keene mm -hmm. State men's hockey team. Mm -hmm. He even said Keene Ice, because it's here, is actually, while well, A, it's bringing in better players, mm -hmm. but now their GPAs have gone up higher because they don't travel all over the place to have to play home hockey games. Well, let's see. And it's bringing in... You know, we, we've all known the problem with Keene State over the past few years, getting people in because of the... No. Uh, I can't say pumpkin fest. But something like that brings in a better student. Brings in a better student. And look at look at what's being, uh, Marlboro Street is being looked at. It's whole new, not rezoning, but new lights and making that another gateway into the well, city. Well, it, like it is being rezoned into a more innovative uh, yes. zoning that we haven't seen before. Where it, 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 it isn't just uh, industrial or commercial or residential. It's actually a, a mix. mix that creates... Uh, um, uh, pocket neighborhoods mm -hmm. that uh, where you can run to the store and you can you know uh, there's a little shop here that you can do your laundry or or, or what have mm -hmm. you like that so you don't have to you know go all go right. away to to get you know just the basic things running if I can uh, circle back to a trained workforce here for a second one of the things uh, a more recent development in the Republican Party that I feel very good about is that uh, you see a lot of people starting to put the emphasis back in vocational training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was like for a long time. I think there was a stigma that if you didn't go to, you had to go to college. You and if you weren't, you were some sort of a less than successful person. Mm -hmm. But I think we all know that you can make an awfully good living in the trades, and I, I think that's an area. You know, because both of us are competing for the working man's foot. But I think that's an area we could cooperate in. It, it, is putting the honor. An emphasis back into uh, people, you know, being being trained. 
The state of New Hampshire has done, I think, a good job with their community college system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, here in Keene, we, uh, in fact, do um, uh, encourage uh, businesses to work with uh, Keene State College, okay. Antioch, and... Um, and uh, uh, Franklin Pierce. That was one of Tom Eaton's legacy. No, 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 no. no. The, 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 All the, up on the hill. No, the community college up at uh, the old Roosevelt School. That's, uh, okay. River Valley. River Valley. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me, Claremont, River Valley. Yes. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> um, that is so very important mm -hmm. because, you know, you just have to realize we, you know, we can't build a world of lawyers. Right. We've got to have plumbers. Or we've got, we've got, or stockbrokers. We've got to have plumbers. We've got to have all of the other people who, who do all of the other things in life. With the and exception of my son, he just got his law degree, so you're exempt. Oh, okay, ahead. go ahead. It can't just be desk jockeys. <laughs> you know, that's right, the thing. We right, need people right. who know how to pick up a hammer and swing it. Right, and they need to be they need to be livable wage jobs. We mm -hmm. need to be able to. A uh, big problem here in Keene, and we're running out of time, so I won't get into it. Is housing. The cost of housing in Keene is absolutely... Oh, I thought you were going to say housing stock, and I was going to yeah. say, oh, shoot oh, me. No, the cost of housing in the cost city of, of housing, Keene yes. is, is approaching that of Manchester. Well, we do have a lot of new apartments coming. Hopefully, I, it's you know, there's going to be, a, at some point, there's going to be a glut, which you, you would many. hope with supply and demand would, right. would, uh, would reduce some of the prices on some of the... But you're right. I mean, even a... Let's face it, there's some dumpy apartments in Keene, and mm. they're not cheap. No, they're not cheap. But we're running out of time, and this was our first trial run. Who knows if this will make the air or not? Probably it just won't. may. It just may. I it think it was may. a good show. You know, I think it was really good. And of course, you know, I was picking my teeth a couple of times. We were banging the table, but I'll have to watch it to see if I need to get a haircut. I, <laughs> I don't think so. I think I'm, yeah. Yeah, I need no, a haircut. The, the front looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> but if this does hit the air, we appreciate you uh, spending time with us, and this is basically what we're looking to do: we have a conversation. Could it get heated at times? Sure, but. You know what? You come I think down the chemistry is pretty good. I'm, I'm I think very the chemistry close. is oh, yeah. good. We have a, a you know great opinions, different backgrounds, and things like that. And you know, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. Well, it, it's funny because even with Trump's thing of make America great again, who's going to yes. argue with that? But it's like, how do you do that? That that's that that's the you big thing. You just watch, honey. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I have faith. I have trust. Don't you, Terry? We have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the nice thing about elections is that we have them all the time. That's yes. right. So if yeah. this doesn't work... In two years. I mean, it's not four years. It's two years. It's two more years. You know, I mean, I'm sure the Senate, you. Senate and Congress people are already getting ready to, uh, you know, to put their names in and, and get their exploratory committees and, That's it. and ready to roll. That's it. So thank everybody very much. We, I think we're probably going to roll with the show and we'll probably see you again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Adios. Thank we're you. out of here. Bye-bye. Make America great.